All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this month's Scientists to Go. I'm here today with Maya Thomas. Uh, just a little bit about her before we get going. Um, I got her bachelor's degree in marine biology from Nova Southeastern University in Florida. She's now in the process of getting her PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, she does a lot of research on zo zooplankton and the role in food webs, uh, and it's brought her all the way to Antarctica, where she's calling in from today, which is so cool. Uh, so I'll get to hear a bit about those adventures. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Maya. Thank you. That was an awesome introduction. Uh, and yeah, hi, I'm Maya. I'm going to talk to y'all a little bit about Antarctica and my work as an oceanographer. You can see the screen, right? Perfect. Okay, cool. Let's get started. Um, so first, a little bit of introduction, even though I already have a great introduction. Um, I'm Maya. I'm a 24-year-old student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, um, part of William and Mary. And yeah, I'm here in Antarctica right now. And on the bottom there is kind of one of my one of my crew's families that I was with this past season. Um, so yeah, this presentation is going to cover what I do, which is oceanography, uh, how I became an oceanographer, and then I'm going to get into Antarctica, where I hope everyone's looking forward to. <laughs> um, but let's start with what is oceanography. So I keep on using this word and let's define it. So oceanography in general is a branch of science that deals with biological, physical, chemical, and geological properties and the phenomena of the sea. So obviously we're you know, very closely related to the ocean. And then we have all these different properties that mix together to create oceanography and they're all interconnected. More specifically, there's you know, these specific types of oceanography like physical oceanography. Um, and it relates to the rest of the oceanography in certain ways. So physical oceanography and personal, physical oceanographers, they kind of study wind, waves, very you know physical aspects of the ocean and how that may affect the biology, how it affects the chemistry. Then you have chemical oceanographers that directly study the you know water properties and you know different types of chemicals in the water column. And how it affects the biology, you know, how it affects the phys physics, you know, they're all interconnected in that way. Geological oceanography is the same, where, you know, the ocean isn't just like this flat, you know, it's, it's very much like the land, it's not just this flat area, it has a lot of different parts of, of that make up, you know, the ocean floor that affects the biology, affects the chemistry, you know, see the theme going. <laughs> and then finally, we have biological oceanography. And that's where I am. I'm very much focused on the biology, but my biology is, of course, affected by this physics, chemistry, and geology. And so I, in general, you study all of these parts, but you kind of focus, at least I kind of focus on the biology aspect of it. Um, so yeah, I very much consider myself a biological oceanographer. And how did I get to here? Which is a great question I ask myself a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I'm only 24 years old, but I think is young, but I don't know anymore. <laughs> I, I need to stop telling myself that. Um, but I kind of knew from a very young age that I wanted to do this, um, or at least do something related to relating to the ocean. So I'm originally from Auburn, Alabama. Um, if anyone knows of Auburn University, their big football school, that's where I am. But if anyone's been there, you know it's pretty landlocked. So it you know it takes a while. To get to the ocean to get to any sort of coastline um so how did i kind of get really interested in the ocean it's because um i have family who live in st thomas in the u.s Virgin Islands. my dad's actually from there and we would always go back and visit my grandparents and i was always wanting to go to the beach i was always you know i want to like i want to go swimming i want to go snorkeling you know i want to be in the water i want to be around you know this island um, and that's where I really realized, like, I really love being in the ocean. I love, you know, I love seeing the fish and all the animals. And, you know, it's, that was like, that was it for me. I was like, this is it. This is it. How do I do this? And from a very young age, I was like, cool, I'm going to do this. I don't really know what that means, but I'm going to do that. So I had to figure out what that means. <laughs> so um, when I was, I don't know, probably about your guys' age, um, you know, just out of middle school, I believe, um, I was like, cool. I, I know I want to work and I want to spend my future around the ocean um, and I like animals so let me work with animals. So I got a volunteer position at this place called Coral World 
in St. Thomas where I got to take care of a whole bunch of different animals. I was basically like an Aquarius, Aquarius assistant. So, you know, I, I got to, you know, feed the turtles and the sharks and the birds. And there's so many cool animals to interact with. And I had a great time. But to be honest, I spent most of my time like scrubbing tanks. And, you know, not all of it was very glamorous, but I got to directly interact with all these animals. But I spent a lot of my time, you know, doing some of the menial labor and doing you know the same thing every day which was fun and a very large aspect to do it um you know for a summer and it's a great experience but it's also kind of not my cup of tea exactly I was like I don't I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life it was getting very repetitive and I was like ah, I don't I don't know if I really like the animal husbandry side of marine science so but I still have the ocean so let me figure out what I do like Eventually, I went to college in no, at Nova Southeastern University, which is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, and they have this wonderful marine science program where, uh, you know, I, I got to take, you know, for my first year, I got to take all of these cool classes um, directly on, like, marine biology and oceanography, and I, and I you know, we, we did field trips where we got to actually go out and go snorkeling and, you know, collect, collect animals and do all this cool really fun stuff and I was oh wait this is awesome I really like you know it confirmed my suspicion that I really really like this and you know it was great to have that um solidified and I you know I took classes where we these really crazy classes you know I talked to my friends who are non-marine science majors and they're like what are you doing today and I was like oh I was just like dissecting a fish um and they're like that's not what I, I did <laughs> but I had a really really fun time you know in this and studying this and you know it's not always like this fun cool let's look at stuff um there's a lot of hard work as well but it was really even you know some of the studying all the studying i did was like i really and finding out really cool information i really enjoy so i was like okay okay still really love this don't know where i want to go in it and then i think this is i really contribute to this this to being the place sorry i was like cool that's it that's that's what i'm doing um, it's when I did an internship at the place I'm currently at, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, so I did this internship called a REU or Research Experience for Undergrads um, after my freshman year of college, where I spent the summer in Virginia at VIMS, basically doing my own little research project. Um, where on the left, you know, we we got to go out and do a whole bunch of different types of marine science. So this one I think is sediment coring. Um, which is more of like a geological oceanography type thing. Um, but really what I had spent most of my time doing is on the right, where I was like flipping through a lot of papers on my computer, reading a lot of papers, um, you know, doing a lot of computer work. And then I spent a vast majority of my day looking under a microscope, counting these small little animals. And although it was, you know, for sure, some people would be like, that's crazy. You spent, you know, a whole summer counting animals and then writing a report about it and I was like yes and I was super happy with that and I think that's what I want to do um and I I did <laughs> so I actually you know that's how I got to the place I am now is I I did that research experience as an undergrad then I came back to VIMS as a grad student and said I want to do the same thing and that's basically what I do now and that is uh basically what I do as a biological oceanographer, but I'll get into more details and why I'm in Antarctica and all of that. Um, but yeah, so that's 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 the essence of what I do and why. Um, specifically, I am here in Antarctica as part of the Palmer Long-Term Ecological Research Study or the Palmer LTER. And I am here in the Western Antarctic Peninsula of, um, of Antarctica. So over on the left uh, we can see the whole continent of Antarctica and I'm in this peninsula that's shooting off towards South America and if you this star right here is exactly where I am I'm on this island called Annabers Island at the station called Palmer Station and it's one of the three Antarctic research bases in Antarctica the permanent Antarctic research bases in Antarctica um, and we're the smallest of the three so I'll, I'll, I'll please ask me more questions um, but just to We'll just we um we're the smallest of the three stations um we're the only on the peninsula the population here tops out at about 50 people currently there's about 30 people um this is my third year down and i'm spending 
spending, I, I got here in November and I'm spending uh, all the way until April, right in there. <laughs> um, hopefully that answers some of the, you know, uh, usually the questions people want to know, but, oh, sorry. Um, but I'm here looking at those open LinkedIn community. Um, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit, but also a part of the Palmer LTER, not just do we work at Palmer Station, but we also work throughout the Western Antarctic Peninsula. So that's why I have this kind of little grid up is that this whole area, which I believe is about 700 miles or kilometer, I think it's 700 by 200 mile rectangle that we do work in. So um, there's Palmer Station based work and there's a ship that comes out and comes through all of these little, you know, all through all of these sections of the Western Antarctic Peninsula. And we do a whole bunch of different science um, on that ship. Um, and that's what our program is, is to see how this area is changing due to climate change. This is a little ship we're on, little, it's, it's not small. Um, but this is the ship I was on my first year. It's called the Nathaniel B. Palmer. And we leave from the tip of Chile, cross the Drake Passage, some of the roughest seas in the world. It's not a really fun time. It takes about four days to pass. And then we get to Antarctica and then we spend about a month and a half on that ship going through that grid I showed you on this ship doing a whole bunch of different science. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the science. Um, and then this is where I am currently at Palmer Station. Um, so this is, you know, this is our whole station. It's just this like, you know, couple handful of buildings and the glacier in the background. And I'm currently in this building called Bio in a little science library. <laughs> Um, hiding out over there to talk to y'all right now. But yeah, this is a little bit nicer picture than what it currently looks like. We have a little bit more snow. Um, but yeah, this is this is where I am. And so yeah, as I mentioned before, I study zooplankton. And zooplankton is a nice Greek word that very much tells you what it is um, because the first part of zooplankton, the zoo part means animal, the last part means drifter. And zooplankton are a very broad classification of animals um, that is animals that cannot swim against a current. So a lot of different things can be zooplankton. You know, the, you know, it's it's a very broad classification from things all the way to um, from like larval fish, larval crabs. Uh, Y'all are in Maine. L larval lobsters are considered zooplankton. Um, and then we go up the size spectrum to things as big as jellyfish and even this cool animal. Um, this is called a pyrosome, and that animal can get up to 60 feet long, so as long as a school bus. Like, these are all different types of zooplankton, and I study a lot of those different types here in Antarctica. Um, to do that, we have to collect them, so we use these big nets. Um, so this net you're seeing right here is two meters by two meters, so that's about seven feet, um, a seven-foot square that we put in the ocean behind the boat, and we drag it through the water. We kind of send the net down to about 100 meters depth, which I think is about 300 feet. We bring it back up and we see what we collect. And we collect everything at the bottom of this net. We have um, basically a bucket that collects all of the animals called a cotton. And then we can look through those animals. We can sort, identify them. Sometimes we do cool experiments on them. Um, and that is when I was on the ship, that was my job every single day. Now here at station, it's my job to do that about twice a week. Not with a two meter square frame net. Sorry, we like, unfortunately we have a much smaller boat here at station, but we, you know, we try our best to do the same things on a little smaller scale. And this is just some pictures of me from my previous cruise experiences. Um, on the left here, uh, you know, sometimes we get, we shouldn't really get them because they're super big. Um, and they usually, animals that big can, although they're still plankton, can sometimes avoid our net, but sometimes we get jellyfish that are as long as we. Um, some other days we're doing, you know, we're not only doing net toes, we're also, this was one day when we were dropping some of our birders who look at penguins, we dropped them off on one of their islands. Um, and then we're having a little bit of a rough time of it as we were trying to cut through all this ice to get back to the ship. And then again, this is us in our, this is us in a really nice day. You can see how like there's no wind because the, the net is completely down, straight down. 
And then this is again um, on the ship. This is what I spend most of my time doing. No, excuse me. Uh, it's looking at the buckets, looking at um, looking at two specific animals um, for me in particular. Um, these two animals. On the left, we have the Antarctic krill, and on the right, we have the self. So these are two different types of zooplankton that I often catch and do a lot of work on. Um, Antarctic krill is a very important species. It's actually considered a keystone species in this area, which means that the whole food web kind of revolve around this Antarctic krill. Um, and they're, they're just really important because they regulate phytoplankton, they eat, they feed directly on phytoplankton, and they're a huge food source for higher trophic level animals. So whales, penguins, all those guys feed directly on Antarctic krill. And then we have a salp on our right, on the right, this is a gelatinous animal, so it's kind of like a jelly, um, and they're becoming increasingly important in the WAP um, due to what I'll tell you about here. So now we're going to get into climate change of it all, <laughs> and, and the reason we, we are in this area is because the Western Antarctic Peninsula is one of the fastest warming places on Earth. So it, um, I just looked this up, the, this area of Earth has warmed about five times faster than most places on earth. So we are seeing a huge, a rapid change um, throughout the time we've been here. So this study, sorry, I should have mentioned this before, but the study I work on, the Palmer LPR, has been coming to this area for the past 30 years. So we have seen this change happen throughout the time we've been here. Um, and that is one of the main reasons we are here is that we can see this rapid change and see how this could potentially, how this does affect um, different parts of the food web and how this could affect different parts of Antarctica and other ocean basins into the future. So what exists um, in the Western Peninsula is what's called a climate gradient. Um, further north in the peninsula where I am, cause I'm, I'm about on one of these islands here, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm, I'm in this northern part of the peninsula. Um, it's currently getting warmer and wetter throughout, um, throughout the years. So the temperature has risen, the sea ice duration, so the amount of days that there were sea ice present has gone down. And there's a lot more precipitation. So there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of snow. And this is kind of turning into what we consider a subpolar environment where it's no longer the traditional polar environment. And further south down the peninsula, um, it's colder, drier, more of that traditional polar environment. And that is a trend we are starting to see. And we expect the climate gradient to continue to shift further and further down the peninsula. And how that relates to the two animals I study is that krill are a traditional polar species. They love it when it's super cold. They can't really survive in waters. Um, warmer than about four degrees Celsius. And so we are starting to see them potentially, their populations to shift more south as they, you know, try to get away from that warmer water coming up into the north. And then selps are kind of the opposites. They really love this warm water. They love like a fresher water that comes with more precipitation. So we're starting to see their populations increase further up in the peninsula. Um, and we, over like our, our study site has started to see how, or is, is looking at how that shift is happening and how, how that is going to impact not only the food web, because, you know, if you're eating, if you're feeding on Antarctic krill and you really, really like the krill, they're really, you know, nutrient rich food sources. But if you then have to shift to the salt, that's gelatinous, it's mostly water, it's not a great food source. So we're, we're seeing how that affects the, you know, the, that affects higher trophic level animals like um, whales and penguins. And we're also, what I particularly like, look at is how it affects um, carbon cycling. So both these animals poop, if you didn't know. And that poop has a lot of carbon in it. And I kind of am looking at how that carbon export um, out of the surface ocean because of their fecal pellets, um, how that carbon export might change throughout the years. So that's what I do. That's very specifically what I do. But also my friends do a lot of other cool stuff I have to highlight um, as part of the Palmer LTER. So on the left, we have one of our whalers. Um, they, they work with these big marine animals. 
Um, and this is my friend Ross tagging a whale. That was super cool to watch. Um, unfortunately, I was not on that boat with him, but you know, we were like super far away on like looking through, um, not microscopes, the other one, binoculars to see, to see this happening it was so cool. Um, and then a lot of my friends, what a lot of my other friends do is they have water, um, is they get water, sorry. They use this thing over here called a CTD or conductivity temperature depth analyzer. And they collect water from a whole bunch of different depths. So this whole rosette goes into the water and stops at certain depths and collects water. Both parts of the big bottle snap shot, snap closed to get water from specific depths, depths, depths. And then they look at all that and analyze it for different chemistry or bacteria or you know carbon they do a whole bunch of different analysis on that water um and then i had to add in the best part of being here is seeing all the awesome wildlife on a daily basis you know so we have orcas on the left um i believe that's a leopard seal on the right and then of course you got all the cute little deli penguins in the middle um but yeah that's a very quick overview of what i do and how i do it um but I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone is wondering more specifically about what I do. Oh, oh Maya, that's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> um, so anybody who has questions, just drop them in the chat and we'll cycle through. Um, I'm going to start off by asking kind of a two-part question. Um, what specifically okay. excites you about plankton, zooplankton? And do you have a favorite coolest zooplankton fact? Yes. Okay. What excites me? I just think they're so cool. I think the diversity in like not only their size and shape, but the, you know, their role in the food web. And, you know, it's just, it's such a broad classification and you can do so much of cool work on zooplankton. I just, I really enjoy it. And so, and I, I've been, recently more interested in like gelatinous zooplankton and like so historically people kind of consider gelatinous zooplankton to be almost a carbon dead end um where we didn't think they contributed much to the food web or to the carbon cycle at all um because they are you know mostly made of water but recently we've started to realize that they are really important um like to like global cycles um, and global biogeochemical cycling um, and so I, I would love to do more research on and you know but like so that's a kind of new area of research where I'd love to be a part of because I, I think Joanna and Zooplankton are so cool there's so many different types that you do so cool things which leads me into my fun fact um, so the picture I showed the one the thing called a pyrosome that was as big as a, as a bus as a school bus that thing that animal also glows in the dark. They have, you know, they have what's called um, bio bioluminescence. <laughs> Sorry, brain stopped working. They have bioluminescence um, in their like individual um, parts of their body, and so they kind of glow in the dark. And they're really crazy looking. And you know, if they're if you know you're at, I, imagine you're you know out at night no lights around you and then something starts glowing in the water something huge the size of a school bus starts glowing in the water next to you uh and that's actually we believe could be the origin of a lot of old-timey um you know sea monster stories is one of the one of the things could definitely be like a pyrosome where you're like i mean if i was like an old-timey pirate and like haven't had a vegetable in four weeks <laughs> i'd start saying like yeah that's a sea monster for sure <laughs> um so we we believe that's one of the um they're one of the origin stories of some sea monster tales that's so interesting and that makes a lot of sense that would totally freak me out if i was just out that would freak me out i'd be like oh nope <laughs> that's <laughs> the end what's the what's the range of pyrosomes can they like you, size range oh no sorry like their uh habitat range Ooh. yeah so that's actually really fun another fun fact is that a lot of basically the biggest migration on earth happens every night 
and it happens by a whole bunch of zooplankton. Wow. So most zooplankton, uh, I I'd say most. I think a lot of animals in the water column, um, they're they are mostly eaten by visual predators. So animals have to see them and be like, "Cool, I'm gonna eat that." But and to and to you know have that not happen because you usually don't want to be eaten. Um, animals usually spend daytime at depth, um, usually over 200 meters or just around 200 meters in the water column, which is about. Do, 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 math, 600 feet in the water column um and then so that's during the daytime while the sun is up and then at night when you know all this, the, the sun goes down and it's real dark that's when there's a mass movement of animals to the top of the water column at to the surface where they can actually feed because they feed off of they typically a lot of zooplankton feed off phytoplankton that only grow in the surface ocean so they have this mass movement at night where they can feed, 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 feed. And then as the sun comes up, yeah, in this, this like cycle, um, for most zooplankton do that because they are fed on. Um, uh, if they came up during the day, animals could see them and then they could eat them. So they, you know, there are some animals that move as much as like a thousand meters a day, just up and down that water column. So their range can be, you know, I, like this, but that's why the, the other thing was like, you know, it's it's going to be at night when you see this weird glowing sea monster and you'd be like, yeah, that's crazy. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> that's so um, interesting. I was so, okay. Yeah. We've got a question about, do you know what phylum a pyrosome is in? That was a great question. <laughs> so Okay, they're an animal. Let's start off there. <laughs> and then uh probably like a cnidarian, I wanna say. So like a similar phylum as like most jellyfish. Uh -huh. But absolutely I could be totally wrong. So That's so interesting. Um I'm not sure. But they're, you know, maybe I don't know. I, I don't wanna say anything confidently, but that feels like a Probably strong vaguely related to jellyfish especially if they glow which brings me to another question i have which is if um they avoid want to avoid being eaten or if when they're seen they're more likely to be eaten then what's the evolutionary benefit of bioluminescence because doesn't that make you more exposed yes which that's a great question um it can also so animals usually also have different types of bioluminescence Sometimes it's like they always glow. It's they don't really control it. Sometimes they do control it. Sometimes they, you know, glow specifically at certain times to, um, you know, make animals afraid. So I would say for pyrosomes, especially huge pyrosomes, it would either be to confuse predators. I'm like, I don't even know where you start or end. So I'm, 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 you know, you could be huge, or you know, just like in general to make, make them look bigger because you're like, oh, I'm not gonna go after this huge thing. And when you realize it's like one, so pyrosomes are also like colonial animals, so they they can grow to be that big, but you know, they have to grow there, so they start really, really small and keep on expanding in size. Um, so I'd assume it's something about like making themselves look bigger um, or maybe attracting pr prey to them um, is my quick theory. But also like uh, animals have like a lot of different types of bioluminescence and especially in the deep sea when there is no light, animals have a lot of types of bioluminescence. I know one is called like the burglar burglar alarm where like you, it's essentially like you, might be like getting chased by a predator. So you glow. So your predator's predator comes looking for to not eat you, but to eat the thing that's trying to eat you. <laughs> or, you know, there's certainly like, there's there's so much crazy evolution, especially in the deep sea um, of animals just like trying to survive and like trying to survive in a place that has no light. Like that's crazy. <laughs> And they evolved all these crazy, you know, aspects of themselves that are like, I'm going to keep myself safe, even if it's, 
like or like sometimes like you know it's kind of like a I know one that's kind of like ink on octopus because like octopus uses ink to like confuse startle its predator and then jet away and animals do that both bioluminescence <laughs> so you like, shoot like a like a ball of bioluminescence and you run away <laughs> that's so cool it's so much the burglar alarm one is really fascinating because i feel like that there's that's definitely fun. risks with that because then your predator can also yeah. find you easier but that's yeah cool. and it also like looks crazy it's like I think it's specifically on this, like, maybe this type of jellyfish, I want to say. And, like, the bioluminescence there, like, goes around, like, some crazy burglar alarm. And you're like, what? That's crazy! Wow. That's <laughs> amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. So much cool. <laughs> There's so much cool stuff in the ocean. The ocean's the best. Um, okay, yeah. I have, you kind of answered these, but we had another question is kind of a day in the life. Maybe you could do a day in the life when you're on the research boat and a day in life when you're at the station. Like, what's it like oh, to yeah. in Antarctica and one. on the water? Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so on the research vessel, we have 12 hour shifts. So like midnight to noon, noon to midnight. Um, and you hope it only lasts 12 hours um but yeah so typically like in the but the good thing is we have um you know on the ship and on station we have people who like cook for us um and they do a lot of like some you know, basic human needs for us to make sure we're all like fed and you know alive um amazing people who do that um so we like wake up at noon and it'll be like lunchtime so I I meet typically on noon to midnight so I'll like wake up at noon have lunch which is like my breakfast um and then I usually go down to my lab and like see if we need anything if it's like a if we're going through the grid and we're like you know we're doing our stations um as we do we usually do a station I think it's every like six or seven hours and this is where we you know do the zooplankton tow but we also do like a CPD cast for the water collection um, we may stop somewhere for a little bit longer and let like the whalers out so they can, you know, tag some whales. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, at each station we have like, we're probably there for like four hours and then we steam right to the next station. So we usually hit stations every like six or so hours. So I, I'll like go into my lab, see if the previous shift needs help closing out. Um, and then, you know, throughout my day I'll like do those two toes so we so me typically I work with one other person and me and that person will like one of us goes on the back deck and actually like go like puts the net out so we can collect all the plankton the other person is back recording everything like you know the date the time sea temperature all of that like good so we have all of that information with us um and then we do those toes a couple of times with not only the two meter net but we have a one meter square net as well um and we collect all those animals and then we have to go and identify and count all of them which depending on the type of toe we can i can get a little long <laughs> you know if we got like a really big krill krill haul it's super super cool but it's also like i don't want to count 600 krill <laughs> um but all in the day's work <laughs> and then so we usually do that about twice a day in the middle we'll have like a lunch um which is actually at midnight or no sorry it'll be noon dinner we lunch dinner and then we have a thing called mid rats at midnight um which is usually a lot of breakfast food um and that that's my day on the ship and you know it's very much you get in routine you do it you do it you do it it's kind of crazy but you do it um and then on station is a bit more normal, which I really appreciate. That's why I can do this for six months because I am on an almost human schedule <laughs> um, where, you know, it's a, I get up at 6 a.m., which I don't know about y'all. I, I I wouldn't be doing this in regular life. It is still too early for me, um, but I have much more regular schedule where I'm like, oh, I do like yoga at 6 a.m. and I come down for breakfast. Um, we have, um, on a day where we go out where we we so we so on station we go out on small boats um definitely not you know big ship size but you know 30 foot small boats um we usually 
I help my friends prepare for that in the morning and I go out myself in the afternoon. Um, and then I usually spend, so I usually spend like three hours on the water and then like another three hours back here processing. Um, and, and on, we only do that about twice a week. So other times, and you know, I'm doing like, it's kind of like a regular work day where I'm like answering emails and reading papers and writing my paper. And, you know, it's a very traditional work day. Um, the only thing is really different besides, you know, going out on the water and all of that is, um, we have, we work on Saturdays. We do like half days on Saturdays, which always, you know, it's not the funnest. Um, and then we usually uh, after hours, we usually work from like seven to, I don't know, 5.30. And then we, after hours, we usually hang out. You know, there's lots of cool, I didn't mention this, there's lots of cool things on station to do. Like they have like a hot tub and we can hike the glacier. We can like go wreck boating. So we just take boats out and go to islands and stuff. Like there's lots of fun stuff to do. So usually in the afternoon or after, after dinner, people can either set something up like that. Or sometimes, you know, we just have like a cool, we have like a whole um, like bar movie room set up. So like that's where we really survive off is like a lot of movies um, and a lot of like different shows. We're currently binging a couple of different shows. Um, last year we did like Last of Us. There's a whole community event. It was so much fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's very much on the cruise. It kind of feels like oh, I'm super stressed, but back on on station, I I, I prefer it because it feels like you're human. <laughs> Um, and you have like a human schedule so that's really nice that's so nice it must be interesting now because I'm realizing you're approaching solstice so you're probably getting not much darkness is that true no yeah we're really excited about that here too (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so we're we're, so obviously well just to make sure everyone knows so as y'all are hitting winter solstice in the northern hemisphere in the southern hemisphere we're hitting summer solstice so it's about to be the part of the year where you see the most amount of light um and yeah so we aren't far enough south to be fully ever really fully dark or fully light so even like on the solstice day i'm sure we'll have like an hour or two but like it's also like not real darkness it's like it gets hazy a bit (laughs) so crazy so it's it's yeah it's it's certainly we're not we're not like full full light but we're definitely yeah like you know the the hours the sun is up is from where the hours the sun is down is from like 3 a.m to 5 a.m and it's like well I was never going to be up at that time either (laughs) anyway so it's cool um but yeah we have a couple we have like it's actually we have our Christmas in like two days because we have to celebrate it early um to because we have like a ship coming in and it just makes a better schedule if we celebrate a little bit early but the day after our christmas is the solstice and i know a lot of people are very excited for it (laughs) so cool what a different lifestyle it probably makes i mean if you're (laughs) near the on on your like midnight shift around that time if you're on the boat i'm I'm sure that makes it easier to work i don't there's a reason yeah there's a reason i took noon to midnight because (laughs) i I know, like, I didn't, I mean, we have, like, blackout curtains, like, a few who could definitely sleep, but I'm sure, I, I think their schedules just got a little funky. I'm sure. <laughs> they, not all of them seem happy on that shift. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, we got one book recommendation Hi. that I'll pass along, and then I'll have a final oh. question for you. Um, Susan recommended the book An Immense World by Ed Young, if you've read it, and apparently it talks about the various senses and how different species perceive the world, which is kind of neat. So ah, seems kind of interesting based on our really cool. snow plankton conversation. Very cool. Yeah, um, I think I've heard of that, but that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'll have to look into that one Thank as well. You. Thank you for the rec. Um, the last question that we'll end on is, what is your favorite part of your job? I feel like we've talked about that a lot, but I want to wrap yeah. up there. I mean, I love a lot of parts of my job, um, and I I love what I study, but I really think the thing that makes my job is like the people I work around. I think one, this work cannot be done without so many hardworking people. And it's not just like scientists in any regard. Like this station has to be run by like logistics managers and the power plant people and the electricians and the plumbers, not all these like different types of jobs that like I think people traditionally don't think 
like is available in Antarctica and I'm like oh I need people to keep me alive <laughs> like I very much feel like these people are the reason I get to do what I do is because you know people with like typical jobs you'd see back at home like all those people are making sure this stays like going so I think one those people make my job happen and that's really awesome but also they're just so nice people and everyone like everyone I work with is so great and it's including the scientists like it's great to be able to work and collaborate with all these people and I think that's one of my favorite things in marine science in general is that I haven't met a lot of bad people in this field <laughs> and I really enjoy like working with so many awesome people <laughs> and you know the zooplankton is absolutely a bonus and you know but the people is like why I do this <laughs> Totally. Oh, that's so great. Well, thank you so much, Maya. Appreciate your time. And thank you everybody for joining. Um, I hope everyone thank has a great you. rest of their day.